portions of the church fall into such a state of insanity? Are we being set up for a grand delusion? On this tape, we will take you on a guided tour of the great apostasy from its inception to the present time. In Matthew 24, Jesus gave a list of signs that would tell us his return was near. The signs he gave would be the beginning of birth pangs, and so we know they will come closer together and increase with intensity. He gave a list of those signs, earthquakes, famines, pestilence, wars, rumors of wars. These he mentioned one time each, but he warned of another sign four times as much, religious deception. He said false prophets would rise up and deceive many. He warned that many would come in his name, claiming to be the Christ. Notice he didn't say they would claim to be Jesus, but Christ, which means the anointed one. He said false Christ and false prophets would rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, we are taught that the apostasy comes before the Lord's return. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed. Forces that arose in the beginning of the 20th century conspired to wipe out that old time religion. Now at the dawn of the 21st century, the forces are gaining momentum and joining together in an ecumenical unity that will ultimately result in a one world religion that the Bible calls the great whore. She is called that because she commits spiritual adultery by joining the truth with error. There have always been groups using the Christian label they're bankrupt of the truth, the largest being the Roman Catholic Church. Then there's the liberal side of mainline Protestant denominations whose scholars are under a biblical curse for adding to and taking away from God's word. But the Bible believe an evangelical side of the visible church held out against error and stood up for the truth. The spirit of Antichrist would have to corrupt them to succeed in his plan to build a one world religion that he would head up. But I believe the great apostasy is a close counterfeit that can even fool true believers. It began when some people in the evangelical church in the early 1900s sought to answer the question, what is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit? This question is in a sense, similar to the one which Jesus' disciples asked him, who will be the greatest in the kingdom? Jesus responded that the greatest would be the least of them all and told them not to lord it over each other. But both questions try to establish religious superiority and stem from spiritual pride and carnality. Before we go any further, I want to say up front that we do believe in the gifts of the Spirit as listed in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. God is not an Indian giver, but what we're seeing on a large scale, trying to pass off as gifts of the Spirit are really counterfeit signs and wonders. They are signs that the great apostasy is in full swing. Yet at the same time, the Lord Jesus Christ is alive and well in his true believers and builds up his scattered remnant in the gifts as he sovereignly chooses. They do not go out making a public show of them, but they minister to other believers with their gifts in the most supernaturally natural way, not to be seen of men. So with that much said, let's go back to see how the present apostasy developed over the 20th century. We'll hear from a man named Roberts Learden, who gives the title God's Generals to some of the most obvious wolves in sheep's clothing. Learden himself is a master deceiver. He claims to have spent time with Jesus during out-of-body experiences. He says that Jesus took him to a big storehouse in heaven where arms and legs dangled from hooks just waiting for lame people to come in and claim them. Learden identifies two of his earliest generals as John Alexander Dowie and Mother Edder. In her meetings, besides healing, people would go out under the powers we call today being slain in the spirit, and uh, people would go into trances, and they would stand like statues for 30 minutes, an hour or something, they would see heaven, or they would see hell. Or in Frisco one night, there was a man during this meeting I was telling you about that came to heckle her and come out against her while she was preaching, and she said, God judge thee, and she pointed at him, and his tongue swelled up, the newspaper reported, like the size of a small banana and hung out over his bottom lip, and he could not pull it back in his mouth, nor could he shut his mouth, nor could he eat and barely drink. And so he ran out of the tent screaming the best he could with this condition. His, his friends looked at him, and finally they went to the doctor, and they could nothing be done. He came back to the tent and, and through writing told her, fix my mouth, fix my tongue. He goes, nope, I won't pray for you and ask God to heal you until you repent and get right. 
He goes, I don't want that. So he's torn back out of the tent. Talking about a hard believer and a hard person to, to bring into believing, a hard sinner, excuse me, to bring into believing. That was him. Finally, about two days later, she agreed. Uh, after he said, I'll get saved, showed him in the sinner's prayer. He nodded his head and said, I agree. She slapped his mouth and the tongue went down to normal. And eventually, Dowie turned on Mother Edder and called it transevangelism and said that it was something of the devil and was the worst deception he'd seen in quite some time in his life, if not in his entire life. Even though Dowie could see the evil in Mother Edder, he had the same unclean spirit himself. But then he also began to go into some other problems. He declared himself Elijah. Elijah the Restorer. Then he also declared himself the first apostle of the Christian Catholic Church, which was the denomination that he was a part of. Then he began to dress up in his high priestly robe. He began to go off. His wife left him. And this was about the time that John Alexander Dowie began to uh, go off into some of his eras of identity where he thought he was Elijah the Restorer, one of the first apostles. He began to go off into some things that were not right. Robert Slearden uses the term God's generals because these men and women are his heroes and he identifies them as the pillars of today's Pentecostal church. And yet he sees no contradiction as he demonstrates that most of them taught false doctrine and were touched with scandals. And Learden makes excuses for his general's behavior and recognizes their traits and their successors we have with us today. His God's General series documents how the health and wealth gospel was handed down from these colorful sources, starting with John Alexander Dowie. Charles Parham sought out the spiritual counsel of the old man Dowie. And as you can see from the next clips, he emulated him quite a lot. And Brother Parham was a, a unique personality. He also had this uh, love for the uh, Middle Eastern and uh, the Old Testament, so he would dress people up to get a crowd in Old Testament uh, clothes and Middle Eastern clothes and walk down the street and say the apostolic faith is back and everybody would follow him. He and went over to Chicago to see Dr. Dowie's healing homes in the city of Chicago to see how Dowie rammed them. He went to another man by the name of Sanford that was kind of a off doctrine and thought he was Jesus reincarnated back on the earth. But he went there to see how he was running his healing homes. And he came back to Kansas and decided he would open up his own healing home in 1898. Parham's life ended in disgrace when he was accused of sexual misconduct. Reverend Parham, though, went through a few more challenges in his life. He was accused of immoral activity on the sides of homosexuality, which were not true at all. He was out traveling and preaching, and uh, there were those who did not like him. They were trying to have uh, trouble with him, and uh, they got in the newspapers, and they arrested him for uh, indecent exposure and so forth and so on. And mainly they were coming against him because they said that he had sodomized a young man and that somebody had proof of it. One of Parham's students at the Bible school was an African-American named William Seymour. He is the famous preacher of the so-called Azusa Street Revival of 1906. Almost every Pentecostal would point to Azusa Street as a marker of the current Pentecostal charismatic movement. But let's see what actually happened there from the point of view of someone favorable to Azusa Street. Azusa Street was, people came from all over LA. The LA Times came over and reported weird babblings at this Azusa Street saying that was the first report in California about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, Brother Seymour began to print a magazine called The Apostolic Faith, kind of named after Brother Parham. Parham now received a letter from Seymour saying, why don't you come and help me with this revival? This thing took off. I don't know what to do. We've got some trouble with some flesh. We can't discern flesh from spirit. We respect you as our spiritual father. Come, come, come. And Parham uh, got out to Los Angeles, got there the first night and stood up to speak and got into the, into the mission. And uh, he looked around and he said, these things going on here that aren't right. He found people on the altar of Azusa Street with uh, spiritualistic act activities, hypnosis was going on, as well as people receiving the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues, and God was healing people. There was great salvations going on. But he found that the two hypnotic, uh, hypnosis people that were controlling there came up to him at the end of his first message and told him, we don't want you here, we want you to leave. And Parmo no, immediately began to say, uh, Seymour, we've got to clean this up, this is not right. Notice that when Seymour arrived in L.A., his message was on the subject of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the evidence as determined by Parham and his students was speaking in unknown tongues. As this message was preached, the pressure to come out with the evidence was heavy upon the listeners. Tongues became a spiritual status symbol. Those who didn't get it were looked at as inferior to the ones who could babble at will. So it's pretty apparent that these generals were dabbling with doctrines of devils and an unclean religious spirit. 
and they imparted this unclean religious spirit to the next generation. And I believe that's where the great mantle that was upon Mother Edda passed to Sister McPherson that went to, went to Ms. Ms. Kuhlman, and I believe that parts of it is held by Benny Hinn that we see today in our own, in our own uh, generation of the healing ministry. But it began back with Mother, Mother Edda to Mrs. McPherson. One of the generals who came on the scene in the 1940s was a man named William Branham. He's one of the best known faith healers who went out on the revival circuit. Many of today's crowd packing faith healers point to him as an inspiration. His boasting of his own importance comes out loud and clear in these clips. It was a stately poplar tree stood about halfway between the pump and the home. Passing by there, there was a whirl of wind in the tree, what we call here a whirlwind. Why, it was nothing odd for that time of year in this part of the country, but it remained in the tree, it didn't leave. I stopped to see what it was, and a voice spoke from it saying, do not ever smoke or drink or defile your body in any way, for there will be a work for you to do when you get older. One night I was praying in my room, and when I raised up, I noticed there was a light on the floor. And looking around to see where it come from, it was coming from above. The pillar of fire was hanging just above and was throwing the light on the floor. I heard someone walking. I looked coming through the room, coming into this light came a man. He said as Moses was given two signs of confirmation of his ministry, that I would be given two signs. One would be the praying for the sick, the miracles, and the other would be, you know, the very secrets of the people's heart. I told him that I had been praying about this, that the people told me that it was of the devil, the ministry. So if Branham is to be believed, then some paranormal thing got a hold of him, and he attracted people who think that if something is supernatural, it must be from God. But they forget the Bible's warning in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. It says here, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Let's look at this messenger of light in action. Come out of the child, Satan by the authority of God's Bible with the divine gift ministered by an angel, I adjure thee to leave the child. And Brother Branham's healing ministry and his gift began to astound people all over the country. Now here's how Brother Branham would work in the early days. He was not very uh, much of a dynamic speaker. His personality was such that uh, people would sleep, they told me, until his angel would show up and uh, begin to help him to operate. He seemed to be dependent upon his angel as he called uh, called it to show before he could start operating these two gifts and begin to do what God told him to do. So Branham at nighttime would just stand there and he would talk and try to preach and really many times he would just kind of ramble. I'm not trying to be disrespectful but people would tell me we just kind of sit there and eventually we kind of just doze off but he th the angels here and when he make the comment like that people would wake up because then his gift began to operate things begin to happen and the people had come to see the signs and the wonders. So Branham's so-called gifts could only go into gear if his own private angel showed up. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, we read, But one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So the Bible says that the gifts come through the Holy Spirit, not an angel. God is not an angel, and He is the source of true gifts. So Branham's angel must have been a fallen one. Case closed. Let's hear Branham's admirer, Robert Slearden, explain some of Branham's doctrines of demons. He began to teach that every time you saw a hearse or a casket go by uh, your house or you go by uh, a funeral uh, parlor or a funeral home and you saw those things, that all those things was caused uh, by a woman because he believed that women caused sickness and disease and death because of what Eve did in the garden. 
And so he had a very strong, toward the end of his ministry, anti-woman attitude. He believed that uh, even animals were of a higher creation than a woman because animals are made from nothing and a woman was made from the rib of a man. So he got into a lot of strange doctrines with women. He believed that the mark of the beast and taught that it was denominationalism. He prophesied in 1977 that America would be destroyed by bombs and wars. And so he began to get off into a lot of wrong uh, doctrines and teachings. Here's an example of the unbiblical paranormal manifestations Branham's followers boast about. There's another great story that I was told by a man that he was in one of Branham's meetings in Arizona and the power of God to hit the platform very strong and the piano player fell off the bench but the piano kept on playing. Not to be outdone, TBN regular Dwight Thompson gives a similar testimony of the same sort of strange powers manifesting in his parents' little church. Well, all of a sudden the power fell while well, the little woman playing the piano in that little church jumped up, started dancing all around the piano. But the piano kept playing. <laughs> Okay, did you hear what I said? Hey, you, you that writes those books, Dwight Thompson. Now be sure to get this straight. It doesn't take a whole lot of discernment to see that the God of the Bible is not the source of the powers these men tapped into. I believe that they came up with formulas to counterfeit the true gifts of the Spirit as they saw them in true believers in their day. Remember, God had true generals around in the early days of the 20th century. There were men of God like D.L. Moody, Oswald Chambers, Charles Spurgeon, and others who believed in the power of the Holy Spirit and whose lives testified to His sovereign power. But the rise of religious charlatans coincided with the Lord pouring out His Spirit in revivals around the world. The contrast between the highly publicized antics of the false teachers and the fruit of the great evangelists of the 20th century is striking. Unfortunately, people were drawn to the sensational. History has a way of repeating itself, and just as the Israelites in the wilderness grew tired of waiting on Moses, they turned to a God they could see and built the golden calf, saying that this is the God who brought us out of Egypt. Today, people are hankering in large numbers for the next move of God. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 39, that it is an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. Let's look at the evidence of idolatry in the people flocking to mere men for their touch rather than seeking the real God of the Bible. Now, everybody here, you see this rock that I'm standing next to? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, lay my hands on this particular rock, and I'm going to ask God to anoint this place. And any of you that are sick, just come up here and touch this rock. And I believe that when you touch it, the one that I leave in it, the power that I leave in it, will go into you and make you whole. a great believer and you have, uh, you have prayed for this hour that's standing here now. You have said in prayer to God that if you could uh, only get to me, that uh, if I would pray that your headaches would cease. You know, sometimes in the ministry of Oral Roberts, the prayer line on the last night of his crusade would be up to a mile. One meeting, it was three miles long of people waiting to be prayed for by Oral Roberts. And so, you know, these people were coming out of the woodwork. They were coming from the mainline denominations. They were coming from no denominational affiliation, no Christian background. They saw the miracles on television. They saw that God did it, and they were in pain, or their wife was sick, or their child was dying, and they made great sacrifices to get to these meetings. Oral Roberts outlived his faith healing counterparts and went on to infect the church with some of the most damaging false teachings. He popularized the seed faith idea that one needs to give money in order to get money, and he got very rich as a result of it. He perfected the art of turning Holy Ghost camp meetings into signs and wonders stage shows for the benefit of the camera. In this great tent, God is going to perform a mass miracle. The power is going to fall all over this place. And if you people in your homes all over America are in tune with God, when the power falls here, it'll fall there. The supernatural power of God with anointing would come up on my being, not only in my right hand, it would stand out in my right hand. That's the point I want to make with it. But the, but the presence of God was all over my body. There were times I felt like I could lift that whole tent. One of Oral Roberts' contemporaries, A.A. A. Allen, was moved to envy when he saw the huge crowds line up for Oral Roberts meetings. So Allen bought a tent and got into the competition. 
he went and sat under Old Robert's tent and saw Old Robert with that huge crowd come out and preach one of his magnificent sermons and begin the great prayer lines that he had every night under his gospel tent. And Alan sat there and saw this, and took it all in, and this is what he said. He said, if Old Roberts can do it, I can do it. But before he began to pray for the sick, he felt like he had to have the power. He knew he had the call, but that he had the power to actually produce the miracles that was needed for the people that came seeking them. So he locked himself away for a time of prayer and fasting. He got in an actual closet, locked the doors, and told his wife, don't bother me. I'm going to find the answers to the miracle ministry. It seemed that Reverend Allen began to try to outdo the persecution by exaggerating some of the miracles that he talked about. A.A. A. Allen's mantle fell to his protege, R.W. Schambach, who carries on his flamboyant style of preaching. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my very happy pleasure and privilege to present to you at this time the man that God has anointed mightily with a supernatural miracle ministry, God's man of faith and power, Reverend A.A. A. Allen. And this attitude of superiority over the sheep in the church continues on to the faith healers and signs and wonders workers of today. This is all setting the stage for the Antichrist, who is scheduled to deceive the world with lying signs and wonders, who will exalt himself over everything and everybody. In today's apostate circles, the people are encouraged to seek after the anointed ones for the impartation of the Holy Ghost power. This is much like the Roman Catholic idea of apostolic succession. In the Holy Laughter movement at various places like Toronto and Brownsville, there is much talk about the impartation of the gifts, that must come by a transference of spirits from one who has the power. The arrogance of today's modern-day false apostles is shocking. You must go to them to get something from God. Let's look at some examples of this spiritual atrocity. Those in your homes, you want that same anointing? I know you do. Stretch your hands towards this camera, everybody, come on. You too lift your hands up high in your home as you feel you with the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, Mary Dima, receive that anointing in Jesus' name. Now, here it goes upon your life. Do you know that God never blesses sheep before he blesses shepherds? Shepherds get it first, then the sheep get it. Because sheep follow shepherds. If we, if we shepherds follow sheep, we're going to have poo on, on, on our shoes. <laughs> so, so. Is that an Israeli word? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> so, so the sheep must follow the shepherds. <laughs> and God always blesses the shepherds first. So a pastor can never see his church prosper if he's poor. See? Never. Well, it's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. Because, because... Do you realize that I have almost read the minds by the Spirit of God of many people I have prayed for? I know this might sound a little sacrilegious to some of you, but really, in essence, you could call me a Holy Ghost bartender. That's probably sacrilegious to some. But I want you to know tonight, the bar is open. The name of the bar is Joel's Place. J-O-E-L. The drinks on the house. Yes, yes. We don't want shoes. Yes, yeah, I know. understand. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> of course, in TBN's theology, as handed down to them from Azusa Street and beyond, the goal of their Holy Ghost baptism is the evidence of speaking in unknown tongues. So they have conferences and Praise the Lord programs to teach one how to speak in tongues. The true gift of tongues is one of the easiest gifts for the devil to counterfeit. Even witch doctors and those in perverted sex cults speak in tongues. The late Dennis Bennett, an Episcopal priest, is one who helped popularize babbling in the mainline denominations. The charismatic renewal within the denominations in the 1970s promoted unity between the Protestant denominations and the Catholic charismatics. 
The glue that joined them all was the ability to babble in tongues. Doctrinal differences no longer separated them, and they all interpreted this as a move of God to unite Christendom. Let's look at some clips from a Praise the Lord program back in 1991 for a primer on how to speak in tongues. Father Bennett is recognized as one of the pioneers of what we called, and I guess still do, the charismatic renewal. Um, a renewed understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit amongst Christians of all denominations. We need to release him. We have to let him out. Just begin to offer him sounds. Just offer him sounds, like a little child learning to talk. And don't pay any attention to how you feel or how you sound. Just do it. The Cratch's next guest that night was the pastor of the Christian Faith Center in Seattle, Casey Treat, who has his own program on TVN. Let's see what he teaches on the gift of tongues. How do we channel this power? <laughs> we need to channel. It's got to be that I believe it's for me and I receive it now. And that releases the power of God in our lives, whether it's salvation or the baptism of the Spirit or healing or whatever the case might be. So the gifts are ours as long as we know how to activate them? God is not the one in control anymore. We are. But I'll get back to that later on. Let's examine further this epidemic of counterfeiting tongues. Here is a sampling of those moving in their so-called gift for the sake of the camera. Obviously not the Holy Spirit, but the flesh activating them. See how you deliver people all right, well, away I, from their position. I want all the, the Christians to stand up. Yeah. 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 What, we do, what we do, Ann and Ross, is, is this. That at our church a lot, when, we have a, when, when there's a deliverance, a classic deliverance of a demon-possessed person, we like a lot of praying in the Spirit or what we call praying in other tongues. Amen. Now remember, Jesus said the first commandment is to cast out devils in Mark 16. You shall, in my name, now the key is I have to know who I am in Christ. I better, I better know I have authority over this thing or I'm gonna get my clock clean. Now I'm gonna come against this thing in the name of Jesus all right. and the blood, all right? Start praying in tongues, everybody. <laughs> It's, it's uh, not always that easy or that quick. We're just acting this out. Dick Burnell, pastor of Jubilee Christian Center in San Jose, California, was demonstrating on public television how he would cast out a demon. Everybody's gift of tongues worked just as well on cue as it would have at any other time. But the Bible says in the second chapter of Acts that the people spoke in tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Author Dave Hunt put it well in his book, Occult Invasion. He says, Nor can the gifts of the Spirit be taught for a fee and learned in a seminar. No one can initiate, mandate, or activate the moving of the Holy Spirit. Whatever the gifts of the Spirit may be, it is given in specific instances to affect God's purpose at that time. It does not become a power possessed by an individual which he can wield at his discretion. It's a great delusion for anyone to imagine that he possesses any gift of the Spirit in the sense that he can exercise it whenever he so desires. And that includes the gift of tongues, a gift which multitudes imagine they possess and can practice when they please and thereby have been led astray. His warning should be taken very seriously. If you're still not convinced that the gifts of the Spirit are easily counterfeited and that tongues does not prove the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Let's take a look at a con man who has made a fortune out of operating in false gifts. His name is Marjo, and he was a famous child evangelist who learned the tricks of the trade utilized by many of today's religious charlatans. I thank God for my darling Christian mother that pointed me to Jesus. If we had more good Christian mothers that would teach the boys of the world, how to play more instead of drinking cocktails and smoking filthy old cigarettes, we would have a better America, better men in 
grown men. And not so much juvenile delinquency. There would be, you know, gestures like when I would say, Jesus, my arms would have to go out, or when I would say, the devil, I would go forward. And she had this incredible set of signals. They were like if she would say, oh, Jesus, if I was going too slow, or if she said, glory to God, you know, that meant you better speed up and go a little bit faster. Then later on, they came up with more signals, like praise God meant, you know, you've got the people where you need them, you better take an offering and raise some money. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Let's have your hands and worship the Lord. Praise Him tonight. Hallelujah! Oh, God is so real tonight. If you can't feel the Holy Ghost tonight, man, you're dead and you don't know it. So why don't you praise him? Why don't you call upon his name? Why don't you worship the Lord tonight? Oh, lift up your hands and praise him. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, oh hallelujah. Notice the reaction of Marjo's admirers. They responded to his magnetism the same as we see today in packed out stadiums featuring Benny Hinn or Morris Cirillo. Brother, say Jesus. Right now, Jesus. Say Jesus. Say it again, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, brother, be loose. Be set free right now. That's right. Say Jesus. Just say Jesus. Glory to God. Say Jesus. There's the experience where you say you're saved, then there's the fire baptism when you get the Holy Ghost, and that's the tongues thing. And they love to work people over. You've got to, like, shoot in on this. When you see people gathering around people and start laying hands on and praying with someone, you've got to, like, come in with the camera, too. It's very important because they'll be laying hands on someone, and the poor person will be saying, you know, thank you, Jesus. Now, this is a person that's already saved, but they're getting the baptism. And someone will be standing there going, and the you know, and the poor person will be standing there, and they're not saying anything. Then after a while, about four or five more will gather around, and they'll start doing the same thing. You know, come on, speak it out, speak it out. Till all of a sudden, the person will, you know, get so overwhelmed by the thing that they start going, you know, and the next thing, you know, oh, that's it, you've got it. Like, they feel good, we got another one, you know. Then they'll go on to the next person. I said, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Thank you, Jesus. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Jesus is so good to me tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I praise the Lord. Oh, glory, glory. Hallelujah. I feel good in my soul. Ha <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh. Sure isn't as heavy as it used to be, though, in the old days. Wow. There's, there's one guy that gets into it so heavy that he's into, he prophesies. And he told me how he did it. He sat right, I mean, he looked right across the table, back and forth at me, and, and, and he told me how, you know, how he confiscates money. He says he's on, this station is over 40 states, and uh, he'll go on there and he'll be, get on the radio and he'll say, I know that listening to my little voice tonight, that there's some lady out there and you've got $10 put away in a cookie jar. Now, God spoke to my heart and told me to go and tell you to get that $10 and get it in the mail and send it to me, and God will bless you. God will give you a reward such as you have never known before. And then he comes back to me and he tells me, he says, if you're on the radio and you're going over 40 states and you're on at prime time, you've got thousands of people listening, the chances are that there are at least two or 300 little old ladies who've got a $10 bill in a cookie jar. And so if you even get, you know, if a couple hundred go over and get it and send it to you, that's two grand that you've made just like that. And so, you know, if you're going to get into big time religion, this is the games you've got to play, things like that. It's a, it's a, you go into it as a business and you work it as a business, you know. <laughs> going to do something for you. Then I'll turn around to the crowd and I'll say everyone, do you believe it? And you know, everyone, say yes, you know. I say, that's not enough, but there's no faith here tonight. I can't do anything. You've got to believe it. And I'll go, do you believe it? Again, then by this time the crowd's go, yes. 
Well, now I'll say, sister, really. as I lay my hands on you, it's going to happen. By this time, you're just like this, you know? Because <laughs> I do a whole thing on you. Then, you know, I sort of, like, get down to, now I'm going to pray the prayer, and everyone bow your heads. And all of a sudden, you go, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and, you know, this time, the shock doesn't get you, you know? How do you feel? Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah! This is God! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Oh, hallelujah! Well, praise the Lord! Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! Thank you, Jesus! Once you get one or two, once that you get one or two that really come off and say, yeah, I really felt that, you know, I had a bad back, I had a bad leg, then there's a whole slew say, oh, yeah, I feel better, too, because, like, 90% of it's psychosomatic. I feel Child evangelist Marjo could do it all. All the ridiculous hype you might see at a Benny Hinn rally, Marjo had it down. He could speak in tongues, slay people in the spirit, and produce psychosomatic healings. But most importantly for Marjo, he could collect big bucks. He could accomplish all of this and admittedly remain an unbeliever. Part of the formula given to learn to talk in tongues is to begin by practicing on one or two syllables, the same way a baby learns to talk. Of course, there is no biblical precedent for such a thing, but the dispensers of the gift will tell you to begin that way and just practice. As a matter of fact, when I was a new believer, I was led into babbling in this way. And not having any grounding in God's Word, I submitted to it, and pretty soon I could babble as good as any of them. The only difference is my conscience bothered me tremendously, because every time I did it, I was under conviction that it was me and not the Holy Spirit. One of the true gifts of the Spirit kicked into high gear, the gift of discerning of spirits. I discerned that it was not the Holy Spirit in control, but that I was opening myself up to deceiving spirits by this unbiblical practice. I repented of it, and peace again flowed into my life. Here's a sampling of what I'm talking about. I was standing outside of a church in Houston, Texas one night, and our guys had, somebody had loaned them a Corvette. Boy, and they was excited. We was going to Denny's to eat. And one of, our little, one of our girls, Joyce Hunter, walked over to the car, and she said, well, where are we going? And they said, well, Joyce, we're going to Denny's. Well, she was standing by the car. They pulled off, and they pulled over her foot. And when they did, she just literally crumbled to the ground. Well, the boys, I didn't even know what had happened, and a couple of the guys that were standing there with us reached over and picked her up and carried her over to my car and set her down. She was screaming. And when I went over to her, I, I didn't know exactly what happened. They said uh, the car ran over her foot. Well, I just picked up her foot and put it in my hand. I said, oh, shadla makasa, in the name of Jesus. Yes. You be made whole by the power of God. Well, I feel that same glory right now. I'm not ashamed of the Holy Ghost, folks. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not ashamed of the Holy Ghost. They begin to speak with other tongues. And, darling, don't you think that's not unusual? That is an unusual response. I when it happened to me, oh, mercy, I was in a church. Everybody was talking in tongues. They had fluent tongues. Oh, they were arabando kapaparabasia. And all I had inside of me was one little word floating around, pookie poo. Pookie poo. And I thought, oh, God, if I say pookie poo, I'll be destroyed. It'll be the end of my life if I end this. Everybody say, come on, man, turn it loose. Come on, you can do it. And I'm thinking, pookie poo, I can't say that. And finally, I just said, a pookie pass, he's got it, he's got it. And I mean, the whole crowd went wild. All I said, but it was very unusual response. And with that unusual response, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I was not, it wasn't in the Bible anymore. It was walking around the church. It's pookie poo, pookie poo, pookie poo. I was just going like a house on fire. Now, let me ask you another question. How many speak with other tongues here? Raise your hand. All right, go ahead and speak.
stop. If you can speak in other tongues, then you can laugh because that laughter comes out of your belly also. Now take your right hand and place it on your belly and just let that joy begin to bubble out of your belly the same way you let tongues bubble out of your belly. Just go and cut loose and let that joy begin to bubble right out of your belly. There are some Bible scholars who insist that the gift of tongues is no longer operational in the church today. They use a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that refers to a time when tongues shall cease. But I don't buy it. I believe that all the gifts of the Spirit are for today. However, in my travels throughout the United States, I have seldom seen the gift of tongues demonstrated in a biblical way, and the Bible does not teach that having the gift of tongues is evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul asked in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30, whether all spoke in tongues, and of course the answer was no. And concerning how the gift of tongues should be exercised, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40, said that this gift, along with others, should be practiced in decency and in order. He says earlier in that chapter, in verses 27 and 28, that, quote, If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two, or at the most three, each in turn, and let, that, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church, and let him speak to himself and to God. He also says in verse 23, that if the whole church comes together in one place, and all speak with tongues, all at one time, he means, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Yet this is exactly what I've seen on the Trinity Broadcasting Network and in the majority of tongues-talking charismatic and Pentecostal churches today. It's bedlam because things aren't done decently and in order. It has been so out of order that some visiting non-believers do believe these Christians have gone mad, and they certainly don't want to be like them or to come back. A friend of mine went to a church where the same lady stood up every Sunday to give an interpretation of tongues. He wanted to test the spirits, so he brought a friend who could recite the 23rd Psalm in Yiddish. So when he stood up and did so, the same lady spoke out the interpretation without so much as mentioning, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Her interpretation was just a continuation of her weekly drivel. Today we're seeing other manifestations of some unknown spiritual power that has no biblical support whatsoever. These include holy laughter, slaying in the spirit, spiritual drunkenness, Holy Ghost glue, convulsions and jitters, among other questionable lying signs and wonders. They are tapped into in the same way counterfeiting tongues are. Let's listen to faith healer Benny Hinn give a testimony as to how he can operate his gifts in the flesh. And I, I prayed for this guy and he had a wig on. <laughs> and, and, okay, that's uh, enough, that's enough. No, wait, wait. That's enough. <laughs> You're getting too I'm close sorry. to home. No, go ahead. I want to hear it. <laughs> and when he hit the floor, I was in a, in a church called Islington Evangel Center in Toronto. And the way the auditorium is, it goes up. So the people really couldn't see what was happening on the floor, except just a few on the front row area. When that man hit, uh, fell, his wick went poop up like that. <laughs> And he, he reached for it with both arms and put it back on his head while on the floor. I see. So he came up and I just wanted to have a little fun, he said. <laughs> so I laid hands on him again and wham, he goes down and there goes the wig again. <laughs> and there he went, there he went reaching for it back on his head. And every time he did that, the wig was just a little, you know, a little uh, out of shape. So we need third, pictures of this one. Uh, third time. I laid hands on the third. There he goes, and the thing flies again. Puts. Now, about the fifth or so time, and I was having, I was having a great time praying for him. And this was in the spirit. Of this was in the flesh. So now he falls. <laughs> See, I'm telling you about my younger days, so you gotta forgive, all right? <laughs> And now he, he goes down again about the fifth time, and now when he comes up and his wig is just all over the place, I'm about to lay hands on him again, and he grabs my arm. He grabs my arm, he says, 
just a second. <laughs> and then, and then he took his wig, threw it up in the air, and then he said, go ahead. <laughs> Yes. See, some yes. things, yes. they have to fall yeah. to get it. And so they'll fall, then can, they can hurt them themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. If they're doing it in the flesh. So the catchers yeah. aren't for those who really fall. Because if you really fall, I know you can't get hurt. Yeah. Yes. So we have them for protection for those who think you have to fall to get something. <laughs> there is a certain amount of flesh, isn't there? Oh, I mean, some yes. people just keel themselves over, don't they? Benny what does Benny what do? What does Benny do? Show me. <laughs> oh, oh, Lord. Many of those operating in the Signs and Wonders Ministries admit they have a desperate need to see the supernatural powers, much like the magician in the eighth chapter of Acts. The late John Wimber used to call it doing the stuff. They want to do the stuff of the book of Acts and produce the power, come what may. But the same bitterness and iniquity that ruled Simon the sorcerer can be seen today in some of today's televangelists who flaunt their powers for the reaction of large crowds. Fortunately, when Jesus returns and establishes his millennial reign on earth, he will do some major cleaning up. We read about that day of the Lord in Zechariah 13, verse 2. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. Let's see more examples of the workings of this unclean spirit. We've been playing the charismatic games and there's no power. I want to see the power! Yeah. You don't have to talk about it when you see it! Jesus, I raised both hands and I said, glory to God! And the side of the camera broke open and the film shot across the room. Father, I thank you for the anointing that's flowing out of my hands. The anointing of God is flowing into the rooms of the people that are watching. An anointing to heal is there. Reach out and touch it. The anointing to deliver is there. Today, we talk more about power than producing the power. If you have the power, you don't have to talk about it. All you got to do is demonstrate it. The more we talk about it is the evidence we ain't got it. They're sick and tired of hearing about the supernatural. They want to see it. Yeah. I'm sick and tired of hearing how it used to be back 40 years ago. I got so sick of it, I said, Lord, if I hear it one more time, I'm going to throw up. I, I'm, I'm glad God used Branham, and I'm glad he used A, and I'm glad he used Catherine. I was there, I saw it. But brother, I want to happen it. I want to, I want to see it now. Amen. And I'm sick and tired of hearing about sweets of gold. I don't need gold in heaven. I got to have it now. Amen. And this is the cry of preachers. This is the cry of God's people. Where are our signs? Where are our miracles? All we're doing is talking about them. Why can't we see them? How many of you just like to see miracles? Of course we do. That's inbred in the human, in the human nature. We want to see the handiwork of God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to get ready tonight for one of the greatest demonstrations of God's Holy Spirit's power. Are you ready? Well, Paul, God has really been stirring my heart about the miraculous. And one of the things I've realized from many different stories is miracles happen because people called out to Jesus and they said, Lord, we're not waiting for something to happen. We're going to make something happen. In the same way the world in its idolatry chases celebrities, Christians in today's apostasy put Christian celebrities up on pedestals and worship them. Christians are taught by these televangelists that we can touch the hem of Jesus' garments by reaching out to them. They send out prayer claws and hold up their hands for us to lay our hands on theirs as a point of contact with the divine. Here are some examples of this idol worship being encouraged. If you're possessed by spirits, we can cast them out long distance on television. Right there in your living room, we can take authority over demon power and the devil got to let you go free. Oral Roberts told me years ago his hand would get hot. My hand goes numb and it just went numb like two minutes ago. You know what is so strange? I can be sitting there and nothing is happening. I can be up here preaching and then suddenly the, the, that anointing hits and something happens to my right hand. And I feel a numbness right now on it. And that's why those boys just flew off like that. When that numbness hits me, it just, I don't know what on earth happens, but it happens. And the Lord just told me to release it on the camera. 
So you people in your homes, lift your hands up high. Yeah, let me get this one. Just somebody stand behind the cameraman. I've seen cameraman collapse. So don't you fall now. Lord Jesus, my God, I thank you for the anointing that breaks the yoke. High blood pressure just been healed. Cancer is being healed. Emphysema and that thing on my hand is getting stronger right now. Lift your hands up high and get it. In the name of Jesus, I don't care what problem you have. You take it now. In the name of Jesus, my Redeemer, take it in the name of the Lord, my God. Ooh. To those of you calling during the program, I want to send you this very special polished hewn aluminum oil vial keychain. It's guaranteed leak proof. It's filled with the most fragrant, delightful anointing oil that I have prayed over. And friends, it has and contains the same anointing that you see flowing in our crusade services. You can minister to your loved ones. This little keychain is guaranteed leak proof. And I know that as you use it as a powerful point of contact to anoint yourself and others, you're going to experience many mighty miracles. Will you come a little bit closer? I want to ask you to draw a little closer. Put your hands out toward your television screen. Put your hands on mine as a powerful point of contact. Now we saw already how the early faith healers appeared to be operating under the power of seducing spirits. But now let's look at the evidence that the source of today's influential televangelist powers is in the occult. Let's start with Betty Hinn, since he fills more stadiums than most others today. I actually, I, I hear this, I trembled when I visited Amy's tomb. I was shaking all over, God's park came all over me. The Lord spoke to me this morning. As I was standing, in that cemetery. Well, the Lord said, I'm increasing the anointing on your life. Be faithful, Benny. But it is, Norman. And God used you to take me there, Norm, this morning. But then when the anointing hits me, I change. Benny becomes a different boy and something happens inside of me. I don't know how else to say it. So Benny Hinn got his anointing from a cemetery. The Bible has nothing but condemnation for seeking after the dead. It's called necromancy. It comes right out of the pit of hell. And when this anointing comes on Benny, he says it makes him a different boy. It is no longer Benny. Well, if it's no longer Benny, then who is it? It sounds a little bit like channeling, doesn't it? Let's take a look at other clips that reveal a source of power involved that is surely not of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself. The Bible says he will testify of Jesus and guide us into truth. The Lord said, take those from the east, lay hands on them, and send them out as messengers of light. <laughs> messengers of light. And I would be preaching in a Southern Baptist church, a Southern Baptist sermon, and all of a sudden things would begin coming out of my mouth that I didn't even believe. Like, and my mind would be racing forward to think about what I was going to preach next, but it would be moving backward, and I'd be saying to myself, did I say that? I don't believe that. <laughs> I would literally see forms of angels appear in my bedroom, just watching me talking. Mm -hmm. And every time I would do it, they'd look so puzzled, like, what does God want with him? They almost give me that <laughs> feeling like, what does God want with him, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And many times, I, I would, and I saw them in different shapes, by the way, they, I actually saw little ones, mm -hmm. about the size mm -hmm. of little boys. I saw that. I saw that. Now, often I'd have my eyes closed, and I always prayed with the lights off. It gave me an intimacy. Don't know why, but I did. Mm -hmm. And to this day, many times, I just shut the lights. Because, you know, it, it, it helps you just pray, but I guess, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And maybe it, was, maybe it was my upbringing because the Catholic uh, teaching was <laughs> that, you know, you have to close yourself in. But we'll pray a general prayer to begin with, and we'll lay hands on you. And the lay on of hands, hallelujah, is to impart anything is necessary, God sees fit to you, but to send you forth, separate you. 
send you forth as a messenger of light. Everybody say, messenger of light. Messenger of light. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Even though these guys spend all of their ministering time in front of a camera, the spectacular signs and wonders they are always talking about never get caught on tape. We hear so much about the dead being raised, but it has never been documented. I checked up on one supposed dead man that TBN regular Nancy Harmon testified was raised up in her church, and it turns out that it was a big lie. The guy's name was Ralph Bickle, and if he had truly died, they would have given him CPR. But according to the pastor, no CPR was done. It was all Nancy Harmon hype, told during a TBN fundraiser. She must have learned that from A.A. A. Allen, the faith healer she served with, who died of a liver disorder caused by severe alcoholism. Here's a testimony that didn't get caught on tape. There was a lady that weighed close to 400 pounds. They said more on the side of 500 heading that way as the report goes. Came to the tent and said, Reverend Allen, pray for me. I have a biological problem in my body that I cannot lose weight. And if something don't happen, I'm going to die. Allen prayed for her. She fell out on the tent floor there on the sawdust. And uh, a few moments came by and she came to. And when she got up, over 200 pounds had supernaturally disappeared uh, from her body. And when she stood up, all of her undergarments fell off onto the floor. One of the biggest marks of the apostasy can be seen on Christian television when Jesus is downgraded and the church is lifted up. We hear about the conquering church and how great we are instead of how great thou art. The spirit inspiring such arrogance is the same one that worked upon the Roman Catholic Church that claims their sacraments are necessary for salvation. See if you can spot the religious unclean spirit in these examples. Now I don't care if your group likes to hear me talk about confession, blab it and grab it and all that other junk you've talked ugly about me and said about all us folks who talk about confession. Talk on, brother. You can't interfere with the covenant that I have of Jesus as the apostle and high priest of my words. And now Casey Treat's coming to tell us how to channel full power into good things, productive things, for the kingdom of God. I think the scripture says the power of God's available every day. We just got to know some keys how to reach in there and lay hold on it. God's done all he's going to do about the yeah. devil. Jesus has done all he's going to do about the devil. Now it's up to you and me to go take charge in Jesus' name. When you say, I am saved, what are you saying? You're saying, I am a Christian. What does that word mean? It means I am anointed. You know what the word anointed means? It means Christ. When you say, I'm a Christian, you're saying, I am Mashiach in the Hebrew. I'm a little Messiah walking on earth, in other words. So it's a bunch of silly semantics, isn't it? We're, in a sense, we are little gods, then, aren't we? In, in that sense. Yes. So those that would put that teaching down want us to have a beginning and an end. That's Satan, isn't it? Those that put us down are a bunch of morons. Yeah. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. If you'll speak with your mouth what you believe in your heart, you'll have whatever you say. We don't have to pray for your will, Lord. And that same Holy Spirit wants to send spiritual light to a darkened world today, but he's waiting for you and me to say, Ooh, that spoken word is the key. Speak that thing. Decree that thing, and it shall come to pass, whatever it is in your life that you're decreeing right as now. As we speak a thing together, it intensifies it. it. As John says, it supercharges it. You've got to say it. You've got to speak it. You've got to s decree it. You decree the thing. You pay your vow, and then he brings it to pass. It's in the Word. It's all through the book. So according to Kenneth Copeland, Jesus is the high priest of my words, and whatever I say rules. Then Paul Crouch quotes from the book of Job that if we decree a thing, it must be done. And I've heard this from Marilyn Hickey and other word faith teachers. But let's look at the passage in Job. After all, Paul Crouch says it's in the book, and it is. It's in Job 22:28. It says, you shall also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. But let's look at the verse they cited, because with any scripture, you have to see who's talking. In this case, it's Eliphaz speaking. And at the end of Job, let's see what God thinks of what Eliphaz said. In Job 42, 42, 7, it says, The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, 
my wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. I wonder if his wrath is now aroused against these men we've been watching, as they have not spoken rightly about God. This is just one example of how they twist scriptures to suit their own false teaching. Don't be surprised when as you study scriptures in order to test the claims of the false teachers, you are met with very hostile opposition. TBN and others have been successful in convincing their followers to ignore any correction from the biblically literate side of the church. Here's some ugly scenes of what you might be confronted with. And if you're gossiping or if you're running down another ministry or another minister, if critical remarks are coming out of your mouth, you're going to get left behind in God's quick work. Watch this scene. And you wonderful people of God, quit attacking man of God by name. Somebody's attacking me because of something I'm teaching. Let me tell you something, brother. You watch it. You're God in heaven. I wish I can just... Ooh. They call it a minister in my foot. You know, I've looked for one verse in the Bible. I just can't seem to find it. One verse that said, if you don't like him, kill him. I really wish I could find it. <laughs> but don't mention people's names on your radio program and your TV program, thinking you're doing God's service. You're not. You stink, frankly. That's the way I think about it. <laughs> Sometimes I wish God would give me a Holy Ghost machine gun. I'll blow your head off. <laughs> but just in case there's one or two skeptics here, I need to issue this warning. You have to be very careful what you say about the move of God. Because you see, Jesus said that which is said me will be forgiven. That which is said against my Father will be forgiven. But that which is said against the Holy Ghost will never be forgiven, not in this life or in the life to come. And blasphemy, people don't understand this, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is when you attribute what God's doing to the work of the demonic. And you know what? If you're not careful, some of these heretic hunters who take pleasure in riding around in an old rattle trap car had better be careful because... Oh, give me a holy hoot. No. <laughs> They'll get... Tell the devil, tell those... Tell those... <laughs> tell those silly people to go take a flying leap. I don't care what those kind of people think. Man, this is God's work. It don't have anything to do with what these fuzz brains think anyway. Let's believe for the blessing and get the gospel yeah. out. Yeah. And well. yet the people that are in bondage to money, the people that are in bondage to money, <laughs> you want me to tell you? Listen here, this is making me mad. More. Take your stupid book and stick it in the bottom of a bird cage. That's where it belongs. <laughs> what? Where did I lose control? <laughs> That's where it belongs, is in the bottom of a bird cage. And I want to say to all you scribes, Pharisees, heresy hunters, all of you that are going around picking little bits of, of doctrinal error out of everybody's eyes and dividing the body of Christ and arguing over splinters and doctrinal hairs and, and dissipating and wasting all of our time when the world's going to hell, I say get out of God's way. Quit blocking God's bridges or God's going to shoot you if I don't. I'm tired of scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites blocking God's bridges when the harvest is perishing out there and God's calling the body to come together let him sort out all this doctrinal doo-doo I don't care about it I did you build my kingdom here on earth the rest of this stuff is what Paul the Apostle calls dung dung human excrement it's not worth anything get rid of it I refuse argue any longer with any of you out there don't even call me if you want to argue doctrine if you want to straighten somebody out over here if you want to criticize ken copeland for his preaching on faith or dad hagan get out of my life i don't want to even talk to you or hear you i don't want to see your ugly face get out of my face in jesus name paul crouch certainly has that right he does refuse to contend over doctrine anymore, as he has increasingly been inviting some of the most obvious false teachers on his network as honored guests, 
and has allowed a new wave of people who refer to themselves as prophets and even super prophets to grace his airwaves. Examples of this are allowing false teachers like Kim Clement, Rick Godwin, Bernard Jordan, Rick Joyner, and Mike Murdoch, and others to grace his airways while barring some solid Bible teachers who are concerned about sound doctrine to come on as guests. The Bible speaks about the need for accountability and correction within the church, yet Paul Crouch has shut the door on all the watchmen in the church and has villainized those who speak the truth in love. Dozens of letters have been sent to him without a response. Christian leaders who have expressed concern to him are seldom ever invited back on as guests. One possible reason that Paul Crouch hates the Bereans in the church is that as false doctrines seen on TBN are exposed, they are hurt in the bank account. Unfortunately, though, he has the attention of his sheep 24 hours a day around the world and has trained them not to think, but to just swallow everything they say unquestionably. They do rake in the money, but it takes scripture twisting to fleece the flock on such a grand scale. With every fundraiser they call praiseathons, they utilize a man we've already looked at, John Avanzini, who is a master manipulator. And guess what? It works. But woe to them. The Apostle Paul was just as astonished as we are that people who have embraced the truth are so quickly led astray. He wrote in 2 Corinthians 11:20, For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. Let's look at John Avanzini in action. Now the heretic hunters, of course, would say, now Jesus would have healed that servant anyway, whether he'd have built a synagogue well, or not. They, but they probably wouldn't be able to say it on television because they can just, they can barely keep the rent paid on the building, much less shoot up satellite because what they're doing don't work. Poverty can take your, make your words be ignored. You want to talk about a blessing? It's a blessing whenever you start to tell somebody how to get saved and they sit down and they want to hear it quite something else when they look at you and said, man, I don't want what you got. You saved? Wow. Well, let me tell you something. I don't want to live like you live and have to drive around like you drive around. Listen to it. Your words are not heard when you walk in insufficiency, when you walk in poverty. Now, I can get a call from somebody, you know, Brother John, I want to tell you that I, I don't think it's right to be preaching about money and blah, 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 and you know, I don't have any money and I'm getting along fine. I'm not going to listen to that very long. But you let somebody call me up, you let somebody of import, you let one of these, you let a businessman call me up and say, Brother John, I want to tell you how God has blessed me, and I want to put some finances into the kingdom of God. I'll listen to that man. You'll listen to that man, too. Child of God, our words have to be heard if we're going to be effective Christians. And one of the curses of poverty is no one wants to listen to you. No one wants to listen to you. Darling, hear me. Don't expect the miraculous until you're ready to do the ridiculous. And I can show you that from one end of Scripture to the other, that the miraculous came when the ridiculous was done. They certainly do insult the poor of this world. The Bible has many rebukes for such evil attitudes. In James 2, 5, we read, Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom whom he promised to those who love him? God hates their arrogance. In the same chapter of James, we're told, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, You stand there, or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Let's look at some clips to see a demonstration of this wickedness and hear Avanzini call this evil good. And that person came in and, and my, they met him at the door and they were glad to see him and they walked him through the building and they showed him everything. Well, why doesn't everybody get that treatment that comes to the studio? Well, see, he was a giver. He gave to Trinity Broadcasting. He was one of the partners. So there was room for him when he came in. We, we, not, I don't think there's anybody in the room ever met him before, but room was established for him. It makes a place for him, see? The late Walter Martin used to say we can know a wolf in sheep's clothing by its diet. A wolf eats sheep. Here's a bird's eye view of the sort of fundraising that is designed to compel people to give or their prayers can't be answered. It would seem God has to be bribed in order to bless his children. 
These people grossly misrepresent our precious Lord and Savior. Just in my spirit, in that car, the Lord said to me, I said, do not come before the king without a gift. Mm. And you know, mm. if you look it up, it's, it's kind of frightening. It's like not verily I say or maybe I say. It's this. It's in Exodus 34, 19. This is the, uh, the version of the Living Bible. And no one shall appear or stand before me without a gift. Mm. He's the king. Amen. We come, we worship, we talk about him, we love him. But see, he depends on us to keep his kingdom going. We need to give so God can bless us. Oh, I mean, I know that sounds a little radical, and I didn't always know that or even believe it. I had to test it and prove it myself. We need to give so that we can receive, because that's God's law. Now, I know the heretic hunters are going to have me on the spit barbecue for this, but let me tell you, you didn't get into church in the Old Testament unless you had a gift. Come on now. You didn't get through the door. You were not welcome into the church, into the tabernacle, into the temple. You, that was the price of admission. Let, let me tell you what the good news about that is, though. You know what it is? Those of us who do give, we're going to get all the reward. <laughs> we're going to get it all. They're going to be waiting on us, boy. They're going to be waiting on us. They're going to be washing our feet. They're going to be bringing you your late-night TV snack dinner. They're going to be waiting on us in heaven. Yes, you laugh, but that's true. That's absolutely true. Are you standing before God without a gift? Don't expect God to keep his part of the contract to help you, provide for you, keep you well, drive out your enemies, do all the things you desire of him unless you are keeping your end of the contract. I want to happen it. I want to, I want to see it now. Amen. And I'm sick and tired of hearing about sweets of gold. I don't need gold in heaven. I got to have it now. Amen. I mean, when I get to glory, all my bills will be paid. Brother, I won't have bills in glory. I won't need to worry about bills in glory. I can have it here. You say, well, Benny, isn't that wonderful to have gold, sweets, and glory? Well, of course. But if I hear the thing one more time of how it will be and how it was, I'm going to kick somebody. <laughs> it is amazing to me that Christian leaders in the church refuse to take a stand against TBN and their conspicuous consumption and avarice. People I have respected still have programs on TBN and share in the guilt because of their complacency. Prophecy teachers like Jack Van Impey, Peter Lalonde, and Hal Lindsey have their programs on TBN and participate in prophecy conferences with such word faith heretics as Charles Capps. They study Bible prophecy and miss the biggest sign of the times there is, the great apostasy. In fact, they are participating in leading Christians into the devil's trap. This is astonishing. The great whore is surely being formed before our eyes. All that's left is the final unification of all the apostate systems into one under the mother harlot herself, Papal Rome. In fact, Catholic apologist Scott Hahn has even given Rome credit for starting the charismatic renewal in the Protestant churches. He writes in the December 1998 issue of New Covenant magazine, quote, The new Pentecost is primarily and rightly Catholic, even as I acknowledge that it first arose outside the institutional church. He credits Pope Leo XIII with praying for a new Pentecost in 1897, but God answered his prayer by pouring out tongues on Protestants. He explains, Prophecy and tongues are signs God sends first to those outside the covenant, those who are in rebellion. Later, when the conditions of rebellion enter the covenant people themselves, he applies his medicine to the household as well. Now let's look at some clips that demonstrate how close this false unity is becoming. I think that was pretty important. Oh, I have such respect for Pope John Paul too. I read every one of his sermons. They bear witness with my spirit. I get stimulated, stirred, blessed. Hmm. That spark was Pope John Paul. And you know, he is the first Polish pope in history. And out of Poland, he would arise to prepare the people for the second coming. That's why he believes in it with all of his heart. 
If there ever was a time that we need to unite ourselves together, it is now. Because there's power in numbers. If there is a denomination that you have a bitterness against or you thought was not of the Lord, we're going to be surprised. Some of us that said Baptists aren't making it to heaven. There's a little Baptist grandma that's going to meet us. Some of us that say those Catholics aren't going to heaven. Mother Teresa is going to meet you at the door and say, hello there, darling. You know who's actually here in Denver, Colorado right now? Pope John Paul II. And what's so cool is the fact that he flew in just a while ago and he is uh, here being greeted. He was greeted by the President of the United States, Mr. Bill Clinton. And they both flew in and just a little while ago, just a little while ago, both of them flew right over top of the concert in uh, Air Force Navy helicopters side by side. It was cool. One of the greatest events that's happening right here in Denver, Colorado, is His Holiness Pope John Paul II right behind us here. And uh, what we're doing here is a big festival that have been uh, sponsored by the Vatican, the Catholic Church, and and, McDonald's. and, McDon yeah, and McDonald's. And uh, actually, TBN was a co-sponsor of this event also, the World Youth Day Music Festival. TBN is at the forefront in today's apostasy, attempting to whitewash Christianity into a hybrid union that all can join. But all roads lead to Rome, and Bible-believing Christians will not go along with Catholic doctrine unless they can be convinced that our differences are just a matter of semantics. The Reformation was just one big misunderstanding. Here's an example of TBN compromising the truth of the memorial aspect of the table of the Lord with the Roman Catholic Eucharistic heresy that falsely teaches that the host becomes the actual body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. The truth of God's word is trampled upon for the sake of expediency. I said, and you said to me, Jesus is in the communion. Yes. And I said to you, he's in the room. I said, you know what I think? I don't think he cares. He's in both. In other words, when you take it, you're eating my body. That's what he said. That's what he said. We can't change what Jesus said. But, but see, the, the heretic hunters get in there and we argue on Forget over the doctrine they of had a transubstantiation the exactly. and all of this garbage. It's a matter of faith. Yes. Simplicity. Not doctrine and theology. Yes. That's sick stuff. I hate to tell you that. The letter kills. When I have Catholics in my service, I know when I'm going to have a good one. Yeah. Because they, they believe they, in the Word of God. They believe in miracles. But you know what? Do you know what? I think what he did is he took bread. He took his flesh, in a sense, and turned it into bread, which is the most common food. Every culture, every society in the world has a form of bread. So he made his body become but bread. Paul, when we take this bread, we are eating the body of Jesus. Yes. Is this that cleansed and washed you 2,000 years ago? His blood. As we partake this blood, this precious, precious blood. I, folks, I'll tell you, it's just like the, the whole Bible has just been rewritten almost. Some of you watching this tape are troubled in your spirit that you may have been deceived, and now you're beginning to make sense of it all great, but the devil is clever, and he will immediately try to close your eyes to the truth. But think back to when you were a new believer. Remember that check in your spirit when you first heard some of these things? That was the Lord warning you. But if you ignore the Lord's warning, the Holy Spirit is quenched, and the conviction fades away. So be careful. Jesus warned us of this great sign of his soon return. Over and over again, he said, take heed, be sober, watch. He ends his message to the Church of Philadelphia with these words, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Don't let experience be your guide. Only the word of God is infallible. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, 
If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Thank you. 